Hello everyone and welcome to my KSB Interstellar Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3. As the title implies, this series is based and centered upon the KSP Interstellar Mod Pack, uh, which adds all sorts of futuristic parts to Kerbal Space Program, but it was also partly inspired by the mod Constellations, which adds entire new solar systems to real solar systems. So this is the real solar system. We've got Earth and the Moon, Venus, Mercury, Mars, and uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uh, unfortunately, not other uh, interesting bodies. Uh, that, that should be done. I really want all the asteroids and all. But for now, that's the solar system right there. And then if we zoom out spectacularly, uh, we see other systems. Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri, Wolf 1061, Tau Ceti, Barnard Star, Sirius, Galice uh, 3293, uh, various other stars, um, quite a lot actually, if you want to go out there, Polaris, and so yes, we can have a very interesting and fun time. If we take a look at Proxima, Proxima, um, we can see that it does have its uh, one planet that we've discovered, there it is, Proxima Centauri b. And that plant looks like this, so it's got a nice little texture on it. Not as much water as we'd like, but hey, it's got something. So yeah, a lot, there's lots to explore here with the KSB Interstellar mod pack. Uh, KSB Interstellar, among any other things, has a warp drive. But we won't be jumping to that immediately, and we'll want to colonize things, so it's quite a challenge. The first thing we did, now I started this, this is all going to be in live streams. But then I'm going to report back to you on YouTube what we did on the live streams. The live streams will be on Sundays in the morning uh, Pacific time. So that's about uh, 5 to 6, I think 6 p.m. GMT says when I normally do this on Sundays. You'll see that the date is May 10th, 2076. And the way we managed that is the first thing we did was launch a New Horizons probe. So let's take a look at that. I'll report all of my doings. I'm sure you want to know the mod list, but that's going to take a bit of time and I'm like fidgeting around with stuff because a lot of the mods I intend to use aren't naturally uh, realism overhaul compatible. So I'm going through the mods and sort of adding realism overhaul um, configurations to them or at least getting rid of ridiculous reaction wheels and making sure certain realism overhaul standards are met with RCS and all. Anyway, here's New Horizons. This is a model from Raider Nick. And as we can see, we've uh, launched it quite far out. It is uh, 23, uh, many numbers, 23 trillion meters away from, uh, actually the sun is what it's away from. So if we zoom out, it's, um, it's like that. Yep. Uh, so if we go by NASA's definition of where we exit the solar system based on when they said Voyager exited the solar system, it's exited the solar system. It'll never really indicate an exit. And in fact, it'll never really indicate any trajectory. Ooh, that's some, okay, let's not do that. Uh, any uh, particular trajectory to any of the other stars. Navigating to the other stars is going to be a little bit hard, uh, except with the warp drive. Um, I think at this point, we should talk about the technologies that we have in this series and go over well let's first start with how we launched this i think that's a good place to start okay so the way i launched that probe was actually a fairly conventional though slightly futuristic rocket and i called it the raptor atlas because basically it's sort of like an atlas rocket except that the bottom we have two raptor engines from spacex instead and uh, there's the new horizons probe right there in a normal atlas fairing this is a centaur stage but not with the normal engine. This is actually an RL-10B2 from the Delta IV because uh, this has better ISP and better thrust. And in fact, with just the New Horizons on the top, which is not much, you can see that it has 8,750 meters per second of Delta V. And we did, in order to exit it from the solar system, we did use a Jupiter slingshot. So that's how that got out there. But even with this stage and a total of 18 tons on top, so, you know, uh, the fairing and the whole stage, you can see 18.664 tons. 
Uh, the first stage, which has, which is actually wider than the normal uh, Atlas V. The Atlas V is 3.81 meters wide. Uh, this one is 4.1 in diameter, and it probably has a slightly higher utilization than the first stage of the Atlas V. But uh, right down here, we've got SpaceX Raptor engines, and uh, these are to spec based on uh, what SpaceX has released so far. And you can see, even without boosters, it's got a 1.45 sea level thrust to weight ratio and 8,798 meters per second with uh, 3 minutes and 31 second burn time. What that means is, actually, with this 18 ton payload, it basically is an SSTO. Uh, I think I was only like uh, 100 meters per second shy of getting straight to orbit on the first test launch of this, and that's just a matter of uh, tweaking our um, trajectory. If our trajectory had been a little bit better off, we would have probably gotten to orbit. So that's pretty impressive. These Raptor engines are no joke and definitely futuristic. So it is all methane and oxygen here. Which, uh, which brings me to a point. Uh, just because we have warp engines doesn't mean that we're just going to use them willy-nilly. Um, first of all, they do take some other apparatus. Uh, let's let's bring up an, a legacy craft that I had built, uh, a craft that I've built before for other purposes to explain this. So, the Phoenix. I think I made a YouTube video about this, too. So, the Phoenix is uh, based on the craft, the first uh, craft to break Warp 1 from, um, from Star Trek First Contact. And what you see here is the booster, and actually I used an F1 for this, and, but I made it look like the solid booster that is supposed to boost the actual Phoenix high enough. But the thing about the warp engines is, and these are the warp coils here actually, they should be inside, but I couldn't fit them. Um, they can't be used in the atmosphere, and they can't really accelerate to high velocities uh, until they get uh, clear of gravitating bodies, uh, not not completely clear, obviously, but you know uh, you have to get it pretty high up before it can start its work, and it requires more power when it's closer to a gravitating body and less power as it uh, goes out. So uh, the power consumption on these, you see, absolute minimum power warp, 1,000 megawatts, power max speed, one 10,000 megawatts, and so we have to carry along, uh, well. Actually, I think the re reactor is in here, underneath here. No, that's a procedural tank with water, sorry. Um, there, oh, uh, this, ah, here we go. Antimatter initiated fusion reactor. Now note, antimatter initiated, which means we have to have antimatter, <laughs> uh, which we have to collect somewhere, and I'll get to that, because that's something, uh, that's basically the first main mission we've developed. So we need antimatter. Now, when I did this, uh, initially, uh, I just dumped the antimatter in, right? But I'm not going to do that for this series. We actually have to legitimately uh, collect the antimatter. And you can see this thing has 10,000 each of these bottles and a total of 80,000, uh, which is actually 80 grams. Each unit is one milligram of antimatter. So uh, most of the volume of this is trying to contain it. See, current 10 grams, maximum 10 grams of antimatter. Uh, I noted the water tank here, and that's a lot of water. It's 15 tons of water, and that is because we use that to uh, send through this antimatter-initiated fusion reactor, which uh, accelerates the water particles, and we shoot it out to create thrust. And so our early futuristic engines, a lot of them may be these uh, these sorts of engines that use a nuclear reactor to accelerate things. And that's sort of like NERVA, except in this case, instead of the nuclear reactor just being a fission reactor, we have a fusion reactor that's uh, initiated by antimatter. And uh, what do we get out of that? Well, we get a nozzle with um, ISP of 1,400 is the max. And the thrust, well, the thrust is pretty formidable. Uh, you can see here we do have to throttle it down by quite a lot, which is uh, easy enough because we just reduce the flow of the water. So that is possible. You can pick different propellants like carbon dioxide and stuff because, well, you're just sending it through the reactor and there's a lot you can send through a reactor to get thrust. 
Um, but yeah, so we've got a high thrust uh, set up with the water and that gets us to the high altitude we need to initiate the warp drive. And you can see it provides 6,681 meters per second, which, which, which is, you know, good, but it's not ridiculous, right? Um, I could probably make it more ridiculous, but again, ISP is just 1,400. It's, uh, it's within, within the realm of imagination. And then we have a little dragon capsule on top because that was the best capsule to pick for this particular craft. So that's the idea. Now, how do we get antimatter? Well, that's the second thing I launched in this series. Um, that it was Antimatter Station One, and Antimatter Station One was launched on an ITS. This is actually the KK Launchers one because the top of it doesn't require the the ship on top, right? Uh, the thing is, I'm carrying cargo this time. Oops, that's why I was so low. Um, I'm actually carrying a cargo ship and I didn't want the uh, unique curve that the inner stage has and fortunately this this booster doesn't have that curve built in it's actually a separate part but anyway we've got the first stage uh, we didn't actually try to recover the first stage but we reserved the fuel to pretend to recover the first stage and then the second stage is highly modified specifically for the purpose of uh, delivering this to a high orbit. So this was the station. And I guess we should get th go through all this. These are the antimatter collectors up here. Actually just one collector is what we have. This is the antimatter containment device and it can contain a maximum of 80 grams. Uh, right in here is the molten salt reactor. So that's the reactor we used. And it provides uh, power for all things. Actually too much power turned out. And these are all the radiator panels for it. Uh, we've got separatrons there just in case there's some sort of containment emergency or stuff. Uh, these will immediately initiate and boost uh, the whole reactor core and antimatter containment away from the rest of the vessel. And here we have the science laboratory, which definitely increases the amount of antimatter we get by many fold. So very important to have one of those. Docking ports, uh, crew tube here so that they can get to the habitation ring. Though it turns out that uh, the habitation ring, if the station is oriented in a wrong way, blocks the antimatter. So we actually have to make sure that the station is oriented properly so that the habitation ring does not block the antimatter. Discovered that during the live stream. Life support supplies, of course. Um, for the two crew that are in the science lab, we've got one year and 150 days of life support. And then this is the station's own uh, engine module uh, solar panels, just in case, especially if we have to get rid of the reactor core, we still want power for the rest of the thing. And uh, we've got asterisk engines here uh, to make sure it can adjust its orbit. And with enough thrust weight ratio that I don't get bored. So yeah, that's how we launched it. Let's go visit it in orbit. All right, so here it is in action. And if we take a look at our antimatter containment device, you can see currently we have 588 micrograms of, of antimatter. So we don't even have one milligram yet, but we're getting there, we're getting there. It's charging, it's good. Uh, the reactor is, um, well, it's not, I, I don't understand the reactor thing right now. It, it seems active. Uh, it's got the right mode. I mean, it's providing power. I mean, if we take a look here, current supply is 3.2 gigawatts, and we are only using 0.3% of that. So we really overdid it on the reactor. I thought previous versions of Interstellar, the... Um, the science laboratory consumed a lot more power. Right now it's only doing 10 megawatts. So yeah. But we'll try and add more modules to these docking ports so they'll be more efficient. And anyway, it's doing its job. And the Kerbals are happy. Patrick and Sigel Kerman, both scientists of course. Uh, which means somewhere along here we have a remote controller. I think it's, uh, that's the reaction wheel. There it is, guidance unit, two meters. 
and we discovered by passing this uh, station through quite a variety of altitudes that this was the best altitude to get our antimatter. It's in the middle of the Van Allen belts and it's about 10,000 kilometers up from Earth. So we're, we're in this sort of orbit right now. Not quite geosynchronous orbit, well not even close to geosynchronous orbit, which is like 35,000 kilometers. So just 10,000, very moderate, but yeah, that's where we ended up. So we're happily collecting antimatter, but you can see we've got a long way to go. We don't even have one unit. Remember that uh, Phoenix craft had 80,000 units, basically a full tank of all this. So we do need to add more modules to this. And don't get the idea that antimatter is the only advanced technology that we're going to be using. I mean, that's pretty far off. We're starting off with it now, collecting it, but that's because it's going to take a long time to collect. And then we're going to have to be using it very sparingly, very carefully. Why do we need antimatter to run uh, to do the warp drive missions? Maybe we could just launch the warp drive with conventional engines, you might ask. Well, the thing is that once we get to our location, once we get to our destination, the existing momentum that we had when we started up the warp drive is still the momentum that we're going to have when we reach our destination, which means just like when you have to when you get to the moon, you have to slow down in order to get to orbit. Well, we're going to have to slow down in order to make orbit or, you know, go anywhere in the new star system that we reach with the warp drive. Uh, so that's the trick. That's the trick. And in around orbit around Earth, your momentum is around 7,800 meters per second. So you're going to have to figure out whether that's going to be enough to like escape the pull of the gravity of the star that you're going to be approaching. Maybe you actually have to speed up to avoid actually crashing into the star or something. Um, it's going to be quite an adventure to figure out the dynamics of getting to another star system. And we're going to be, of course, uh, going to other planets first. Let's take a look at some of the technologies and parts and mods that I have in the VAB to work with to build our craft. I think the best way to cover them is just go through the fuel tanks. You can see the normal fuel tanks here. There are some that are uh, attached to the Raider Nick American probes that I've got in there. I just add Voyager, New Horizons, you know, the ones that left the solar system. Um, here we have nuclear fuel drums. Uh, so that's for enriched uranium for reactors and such. And uh, we've got USI colonization parts. So yeah, when we colonize, we'll be using USI colonization, the 1.1.3 version of USI colonization, because uh, to get all these mods working in 1.2, I don't think they're all working for 1.2. So we're in 1.1.3. Um, realism overhaul is active, and I'm going to continue to, so you can see modular fuel tank with all the real fuels and stuff like that. I mean, you've got FAR and uh, real heat, etc. And so we're going to be working with all that and I'm going to make sure all the additional mods like lackluster labs, for instance, I have here. And uh, so I've created additional configurations, work in progress, realism overhaul. And what I did to the lackluster labs parts is add a methylox. Well, let's add one here. So they've got methane and oxygen set up um, and that scales the mass and the volume of it scales properly. That's nice. And we could have liquid methane, liquid oxygen, and then MMH and N204 is supplanting uh, monopropellant. So yeah, those are now useful. And further on, we see the interstellar pack tanks, you know, deuterium, tritium, and helium-3 for the fusion reactors. Uh, Dockluster Labs, I've even adjusted the engines. So here we have, instead of the normal lackluster lab engine, is a Gimbling Super Draco pack. I have no idea why it's in fuel tanks. Uh, I certainly didn't put it there, but that's basically four Super Dracos uh, and everything. And also we've got a Mephalox version of Dracos, which fits perfectly with our fuel tanks, right? We can set up the fuel tanks for methane and oxygen, which uh, the Mephalox uh, Super Draco would use. And those are the stats for the Mephalox Super Draco. But also we... Oh, sorry. Didn't want to... I wanted to change the setup. Uh, MMH and N204 is the fuel that the uh, regular Super Draco uses. So we're pretty good on that sort of thing. Um, uh, Mark II uh, expanded or extension, uh, I forget what it's called exactly, but yeah, new Mark II parts and the Mark IV parts. So we've got these 
big sort of ships, and I've reskilled them to be realism overhaul skilled. So the Mark II uh, parts are scaled to match the realism overhaul scale convention, which is uh, 1.6 times the size of the regular ones. So here's a rescaled Mark II cockpit, and uh, so that fits with that inverter. And if we take a fuel tank, uh, normally uh, this would be 1.25 meters, right? But if we take a uh, one of these procedural tanks, oh, and I've got the Pika X tanks, which have extra heat shielding. Uh, so that's another mod that I made. Well, modification on the existing uh, procedural parts. So you can see uh, the diameter is greater than two meters here. It's actually 2.5. So yeah, but that's uh, that was re the Mark II cockpit was resized by Realism Overhaul, and I just made sure the other Mark II parts match that. Okay, and other stuff that you should know we have we have SSTU engines, not the rest of the SSTU parts, uh, just in case we need those. Um, we've got a variety of solid boosters, jet engines from AJE. And um, yeah, so we're not we're not lacking in chemical rockets. Is the point? Uh, Nerva, this is uh, this is a non-RO Nerva though. I wasn't able to adjust that. I've got a work in progress one. Um, oh, we've got a work in progress linear linear aero spike based on the J2T, and that's two J2Ts right there. And this is a radial nuclear engine. I think I might want to make that bigger. Um, yeah, and rescaling it would uh, actually uh, change the thrust of it too. But I just think the physical model ought to be bigger for that nuclear engine. Though it's not uh, as high powered as the, as the Nerva. It's actually 1.82 tons uh, with a max thrust of 69.5 kilonewtons. It was a realism overall configuration for a bimodal uh, bimodal uh, nuclear engine and so I just copied those stats so I didn't make up the stats I just copied them off of another realism overall configuration so that's what we got 930 vacuum ISP and apparently those are real stats for a real bimodal nuclear engine and yeah uh, other things we have a tokamak fusion engine so these are the interstellar stuff so if you want a fusion engine there's a fusion engine Costs a bundle, uh, one million funds. Uh, Vasimir engine, for those who would like that sort of thing. Um, it's a bit higher powered. I'll have to, well, it says per megawatt. So I'll have to review, I need some sort of documentation or something to determine whether the mass is right. Obviously 1.0 tons suggests that um, the mass is not correct. It's just a random number, uh, but I'll need to know whether this uh, these amounts of kilonewtons per megawatt is reasonable. Yeah, I don't know how much thrust we get per megawatt from a Vasimir engine. So there, that's why it's work in progress. I, there are a lot of numbers to be reviewed and questioned. A nuclear ramjet engine? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, that is... That I have no idea how to judge. Plasma thrusters, though? I mean, it's just 7 kilonewtons per megawatt. What's the ISP on this? Well, that's a zero, but I bet, uh, I guess we'll have to attach it to something. Oh, well, here we go. ISP 11,000. So this is sort of like one of those, uh, it's like ion engine class kind of thing, but the thrust is pretty high, so we'll have to look at that. And so that's the work I need to do. Um, yeah magnetic nozzles and all. I think uh, as far as thrust is concerned, the uh, whole attaching uh, antimatter to an antimatter initiated fusion engine and then having that expel water out the back, that, that setup at least I, I'm reasonably confident that the numbers are not crazy. As The ones that I'm actually questioning are like the ions, the vasimirs, the, really, the ones that are really low thrust normally and whether Interstellar is overdoing the thrust on those or whether we may need to make them heavier to simulate like a cluster of ion engines sort of thing. Actually, I made some clusters of ion engines somewhere around here using the, the Black Cluster Labs parts. The, they're not showing up or they ended up in the fuel tank category. 
Here we go, radial ion cluster. You can see 24 ion engines producing 0 0.001 kilonewtons, so one newton. Um, that ISP though seems wrong. But yeah, I'll need to take a look at that. So there's a lot to be done. And I think this is going to be an interesting thing. If you want to see the launches, of course, you're going to have to show up for the live streams. But I'll go over what we've done so you can see the interesting crafts that we've built and, you know, what, what we've accomplished on the live streams. Uh, so I hope it'll be fun for everybody. All right. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.